Hey, welcome to Home Renovation. This is our channel designed for homeowners to help you guys do renovation projects at home, DIY style, and get professional looking results. Today, we are going to be dealing with a concrete slab. That's right, we're working outside and we're gonna get into how to build a concrete slab and we're gonna do it with just a few handy tools. Stay tuned. So in this project, we are building a shed in the backyard and we're going to build it on top of a concrete slab. So we thought that we would take the time to go through the process for making a concrete slab because there are a lot of things you can use when you know how to use concrete. You can make walkways and um, foundations for small buildings and you can just have like an unlimited opportunity to solve problems around your house with concrete if you know how to use it. It's also a great foundation if you're building stairs or even going up and on off the deck. So there's no limit to it, right? But you got to get the process proper. And this is what it's all about today. There's some science behind it. And if you understand the science, then if you run into specific problems, you'll know how to solve them too. So let's get busy here. We've basically just done an outline here. It's an eight by 12 slab that we've made here. And I do this just because I'm a visual guy. I like to see what I'm going to end up with. And I, I can kind of use this layout here to identify my problems. So the process is simple. First, you have to have your layout. Second, you gotta get rid of your organics because there's no sense building anything structural on top of grass. It's gonna end up rotting and everything's gonna be moving around and you'll get a big crack in your concrete and you don't want that. So we have to remove our grass, get these stones out of the way. We have to build a frame, we have to level the frame. We wanna introduce gravel because we need drainage. We can use that to level everything off. Then we'll get into the mixing of the concrete and then we'll deal with how to finish it off so you get a decent look. Now, in this video, we are not gonna be approaching this as professional concrete installers. I am not one. <laughs> I work with concrete a little bit, usually just fill in holes in basements. But in this video, we're gonna show you how to use some of the basic tools you have at home so that you don't have to spend a fortune in order to get into the concrete business. Here we go. So basically we just have a few basic garden tools. I'm pretty sure everybody has these if you own a house with a backyard. Otherwise you wouldn't have much need of a pad. So we've got some stone shovels and this is my little garden shovel. This is great, it's for edging, but this does a really nice job of getting the sod removed, okay? And just a thought, if you have a lot of sod and it's really thick grass you need to remove, there is a sod cutting machine that you can rent and it drops a blade in there and it does a really quick job. It can be a little bit of a, a pain in the butt picking it up and cleaning it and taking it back. But if you're doing a large area, it makes a real quick work of that. Next, we're gonna need this large tooth rake. This is for moving our gravel around. Of course, a level, and then various shovels because we have slope. Almost every yard has got a kind of slope. So you're gonna be moving some dirt. Can't get away from that. Um, and then that's really it. It's not that tricky. The only other secret we, weapon we have here today is we have a concrete mixer. <laughs> We're not mixing concrete in a pail. If I did 50 bags, I would probably go through a dozen pails. The little technique I use of mixing concrete in a pail for filling a hole in the basement doesn't work here, unfortunately, because after the third or fourth bag, the pail blows up. So we've gone out and picked up this little handy dandy homeowner version of a cement mixer. It's one bag at a time. We're gonna put it through the ringer today and see how well it works. Hopefully it lasts the whole day <laughs> and we don't run into problems. And of course, our tools are in the description below if you wanna take a look. And we have an awesome wheelbarrow over here. I don't know where Max got this thing. It's got two tires on it. I love it. It just seems to make the whole process a lot easier for moving things around. Now, there's not much else to do other than talk about the fact that we have to get dirty. It's hot today. I'm gonna to be a mess. So let's just get to the chase. Time to get dirty. So like a lot of jobs, step one of your project is always preparation. So what we need to do is remove our organics and our stones here out of our way so that we can have a nice compacted gravel base. So we're gonna just get dirty and roll this up and get it out of here. And we're gonna start by trying to salvage these big blocks because I would like to use these as a ramp later for my lawnmower so that I can open up a side door and push that lawnmower into the back of the shed instead of coming through the front door all the time and getting everything dirty. That's a great way to lift the rock. 
Sweet. So when you're removing sod, remember the roots for the grass are actually what you want to get rid of. So you're looking for about an inch, inch to a quarter, and that's generally what was left after we pulled those big stones out of the way. So all you do, get this little garden rake. Now look at this. Once you're underneath the roots, everything comes up real nice and easy. That's not that tricky, is it? That's why the, the beauty of this straight blade, right, that does all the work for you. You don't want to fight it from the top because you're trying to cut through all the roots. Here we're just separating this root material from the dirt. Okay, so we've got rid of our organics, and now we are just trenching the front of the pad. This is at the high side, and it's just a matter of creating a hole. Because we're on a hill, and I'm using these five quarter boards as my framing, I'm gonna stick this in. I wanna be able to drop it in so that my concrete finish is just a little bit above the grass. And then I'm gonna level off the box, okay? Now, the sides don't need to be leveled off but the front and the back sure do, because we're gonna use a 16 foot board to screed our concrete later, and we'll show you that. But in order to get this level and get our concrete as close to the grass as we can, so we're not building out of the ground, we're gonna dig a trench here, set in our board, and then we'll screw it all together and level it off. One of the advantages of building a shed and a clearing is we're not running into too many roots. <laughs> Just keep in mind, if you're near a larger tree, you might need to have yourself a sawzall tool handy to cut through some of these as you go. Set this in. Perfect. Now it's just a matter of setting the right height. So we're at the point where we've got our organics taken care of. We've got our trench built. This is going to be our, our front ridge board. Now, really want to take a look at the slope of your ground here. Start at your high point on the front of the, of the, uh, the pad. And the reason being, when you do get a heavy rain and the rain's gonna be coming, following the grade of the property towards your pad, it's nice if your pad's a couple inches higher than the grass. A, it's easy to trim when you're cleaning up your grass work, but it's also nice to divert the water around the sides and so it doesn't come over the edge of the pad and then try to infiltrate the structure that we're gonna put on top of this pad. Because we're making a shed, we just wanna think through what happens in extreme weather so we don't run into problems with thaw free cycle and crazy storms. So having it elevated is gonna be really beneficial. So this is our high side. So we're gonna establish our point here about two inches above the grass. And we're gonna use one of these right there in my corner. And I like that. And this is basically going to be, uh, that's it. That's gonna be the height of my pad, off my patio. I'm about two inches there. I think I like that. Now, we're going to level all the way across the front using three bricks and our big level here. And then we're going to level the back. Okay, now the sides, we're just gonna to screw together, hold it all in, add some stakes, and then we're ready to start doing our backfilling. But first of all, let's just go over to the middle here. Obviously, I'm way too low here. So I'm just gonna put in a little bit of dirt, lift that up. See if that works. And now I can go, and now I see how much I have to raise this up. Wow, that's pretty substantial. Finally, we have more than we need. I'm just gonna wiggle this around until we get it down to where we want it. Perfect. Now, just a quick note. 
the longer your level, the more accurate it's going to read, especially when you're dealing with lumber. This is a six foot, so this works really well in a lot of cases. Ah, so now that we have that level, I'm just going to put up the sideboards, throw one screw on each end, just to keep the joint closed. Now we're going to go set up at the back side, do the same thing there, only this time we're going to use one of the 16 foot boards and we're going to level from the front side to the back side and get this all squared off as well. So we've got our 16 foot board here and this is almost one of these situations where you want three hands. I'm going to lift this board now and I'm going to find out roughly how much I have to build up before I get too crazy. There we go, that's level. Amazing, eh? Wow, just a little bit more than that brick standing on end. That'll give you an idea of how much buildup we have to have back here. I'm expecting a little bit of weather to get in the shed, so it'd be nice if it had a little bit of a drainage effect off the back end. I am about three-eighths of an inch slower than I should be right now. That's a little bit much, so. When I put the, the level on, I knew I had to bring this board just a little bit higher than that. So I don't really need this board right at the moment. What I'm going to do is just lift this board up flush and then a little bit and drive a screw in to set the corner. Okay, and now we'll go check the other side. That is actually crazy. That's a little bit too high. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that just gets crazy. So you can see we just finished off figuring out that our level is way up here, almost eight inches off the ground. Uh, that's going to involve way too much aggregate and way too much work to fill this hole. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to reset our, our first ridge here, much lower, flush with the grass. Ah. Now, we originally talked about the design. We wanted to have it higher than the grass for drainage. So what we've just done is we've decided that because there's so much backfill to go on, after we're done with the pad, we're gonna dig out the first eight, 10 inches of grass around the perimeter and put in some river stone to fill that up. So that way the ground has a natural drainage around our slab. We can accomplish the same thing doing that way. And it'll also help to remove the amount of aggregate and work that's gonna be necessary to fill this hole. Oh, let's start all over again. Okay, so now we basically have our, our frame all figured out. One last step we have to do with the framing, and that's square it all off and then put in our posts. We want to add a couple of little, little two by two stakes just around the perimeter to help keep things from flexing underneath the weight of all the aggregate and cement that we're putting in here. Other than that, we're pretty much good to go. We have some reinforced steel that we're going to put in as well after we put in our stone. And that is going to be just to provide this slab with some strength because we do have four season weather here and when the ground freezes it'll help hold it in one piece and it'll raise and fall together in the winter time and that'll be really important because basically it, it freezes around the outside first and as the frost line creeps in the ground starts to lift and you want your slab to lift together and then settle together so the reinforcement I, I am on anything outside is super super important now to square this off it's time to get a little bit of Pythagoras theorem going. I know that sounds scary, that's math, right? So what we're looking for is combinations of three, four, and five. So three feet on one side, four feet on the other side. Then the, the other side of that triangle should be five. So if we go six, eight, and 10, that's what we should be looking for. Wow. I'm only a quarter inch off. And since it's a slab and it's outside, I think that's about as square as I need to make that today. <laughs> Fantastic eyeballing job. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, one on the short side, two on each of the long sides, one on that short side. I got extra ones. Yeah, we're just gonna drive them in here. That works. So back here, the ground's a little tough, so I made myself a little Dracula stick. <laughs> Gotta love having a skill saw on the job. And here, well, that's gonna work. That's gonna be awesome. Ah. 
<sighs> the best thing about concrete, folks, it's not art, it's just science. <laughs> so I'm just gonna backfill this dirt here that we pull out of the way, back to where it came from, and then it's time to get the wheelbarrow out and get the, uh, get the stone shoveled in here. Before you know it, it's gonna be time to pour concrete. All right, now, what we have here is half inch clear stone, and you're gonna find, most cases, residential. They're gonna drop this off in your front yard, and you're gonna have to bring it back here. And you can either bring it back when it's time to fill the pit, or you can do some of this work in advance. So just remember, when you're ordering stone delivery, make sure you understand the context of the contract. Are they dropping it at the end of your driveway so that you can't get your car out? Make sure you're pre prepped and ready to go for that. Because uh, most cases, these delivery services are just drop it at the driveway and go. And it only takes them less than five minutes. And if you're not paying attention, they'll be done and gone before you realize that you got a lot of shuffling to do in order to go pick up the kids from school. <laughs> and just keep in mind too, the cost of the stones, two yard purchase, 36 bucks. It'll, be, it'll vary depending on your region, but it's about the same kind of price, right? And it's the delivery that costs the money. But if you were to bring this much stone back in bags from a, a building store, it would cost you maybe four or $500 for the same amount of stone if they package it in plastic for you. So for that kind of money, you can buy yourself a handy dandy wheelbarrow like this with two wheels. And it's so much easier to work with. Do 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 do. <laughs> so I've got about 20 trips of the stone, and then we'll be able to set a rebar. Woo! Just remember, one of the advantages of moving all your stone onto a blue tarp is when you're almost done, you can empty out all of what's left and not leave a mess on your yard. Ta-da. When, uh, when you're raking out your stone, don't be too particular about whether it's two inches or three inch depth. We're just trying to get it in the ballpark. Remember, we're putting just a shed on here, so it's not like we're supporting the weight of our entire house. <laughs> we just want to have it somewhat level. Make sure it's pushed in all the corners. You won't have cement oozing out all over the ground. Okay, so our, our steel grid here is four by eight feet. <laughs> Made our box 12 feet wide. It's kind of a no-brainer. We're gonna put in three. Now the reason I'm putting it primarily to the front is that in this shed, our design is the front couple of feet are gonna be exposed to the elements where the back is all inside the shed. And honestly, if we get a crack in the floor in the back of a shed, doesn't really matter but up front we really want to do everything we can do to make sure that this stays in one piece we are all ready to mix our cement now I call me old-fashioned but I like to bring my work to where I'm working so we set up our mixer in the pit with our concrete and we're gonna bring the water over here and we're just gonna fill left to right front to back so every couple of feet at a time and we'll screed it and then we'll move the machine over after we've deleted some bags. And we'll just keep doing that until we work our way out of the pit. Now, I think we're going to need a lot more concrete than we see here right now. But it's just nice to get started where it's convenient. Remember, read instructions. Back of the bag says it takes 2.7 liters of water for every bag of concrete. This mixer is a one bag at a time deal. And it's really simple. We put the contents in here. Water first, concrete second. Open up the, pour it out on the ground, rake it around. Rinse, repeat, <laughs> as April Wilkerson would say. We're gonna do that probably around 45, 50 times. 
and then we'll have a nice finished pad. We're also going to uh, smooth it out as we go. So we'll screed it, and then I just brought whatever tile trowel I had laying around. I got a nice flat smooth edge on it, and we'll give the, the concrete a nice smooth finish before we move on too far. So anyway, we're just going to use this measuring cup to figure out our 2.7 liters, make a black mark on our pail so that we can do the same thing over and over again and have some continuity with our concrete. Really, life is that simple sometimes. We're going to work with that. All right. Uh, now we don't need the pitcher anymore, but we do need our black marker. And find a level spot. Wow. There we go. That actually shows up from the inside. Okay. Beautiful. So now we're going to give this machine its inaugural run. Now Max picked this up at a local store and it was a floor model. It did not come with instructions. So bear with us while we try to figure out how this thing operates. Let's see, we'll just push the green button and see what happens. Oh yeah. All right, we'll get this bad boy turned on. We do not have the ability to lock this in place. I think this is going to be a long day. <laughs> That's not so bad. <laughs> it has a mind of its own. <laughs> this is awesome. Just gonna put it on a bit of an angle here so that it'll mix thoroughly through. Wow, I'm thinking we're gonna have to do this on um, on a time lapse video so I can get Max to help me. This is a two man operation. So I think obviously the 2.7 liters per bag, those are directions if you're mixing it by hand in a wheelbarrow. Using this kind of machine, you're gonna use a little bit more water or it just won't, won't mix up properly. Part of that's because it's leaking, but I think part of it's just the nature of how this tumbles. Anyway, that's all right. <laughs> Let's just get at it because uh, that's a lump of cement right there and we got to get moving this thing around. <laughs> So you can see we are almost halfway through mixing our concrete. It's been a little over an hour. Um, just wanted to take a minute now and discuss some of the techniques that we're using here. Uh, I figured it was easier for you to see the process and then we could discuss it so it kind of made some sense. We are using a 16 foot piece of lumber as our screed board and it basically runs from ridge to ridge and creates a flat surface. And just like when we're doing drywall mud, or any other kind of finishing, we start from rough and push towards finish. Okay? Now this is a lot easier with a second person, like you saw in the other footage, but now he's holding the camera. So, 
that's the process. Once you get done to a certain point where you don't have holes to fill, you just jump to the other side and then come back with a lot of movement. And you can see that's how you get your surface. If you get any potholes or that sort of thing, just take a handful, shove it in and go again, okay? It's that simple. Once we were done our screeding, I was just taking my trowel, and this is actually used for doing tile work, but what it has, it has one straight edge right here. And I'm using this to act as my float. And you'll see that when you run it over the surface, it magically makes everything smooth. All right? After about 45 minutes, the concrete sets up, and then you can just take your big shot broom and lightly drag it across the concrete. Now, if you have a big nasty chunk of debris, that kind of wrecks the look. Now, that puts a texture on the concrete so that it's not slippery in the winter time or when it rains, and generally it makes all of the little ripples go away. So, this isn't quite as old, and you can see when I run that broom, it does an okay job, but it's grabbing chunks of rock and pulling it up out of the cement, and you don't want that. So if that happens to you, pull this out, take your trowel, smooth it off again, give it another 15 or 20 minutes, and come back to the broom, you'll be good to go. <laughs> Call me crazy, but when I'm working out in this kind of heat, I like to wash everything up about once every hour or so, it just makes it a lot easier at the end. Nothing's baked on. Besides, on a day like today, a little bit of spray off the hose never hurts. <laughs> so there we go. That's all the tips and tricks for working with a cement slab that I've got for you. Um, the only other thing we're going to do is at the end of the video, we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to hammer off all of the boards and reveal the finished slab. So we're going to get back to work now and turn the camera off and we'll catch you in a minute. Okay, well we're back out on our pad here. This is pretty awesome. Uh, it's been a few days and as you can see there was a fence company that came by and put up the fence between the neighbors and that's why we gave this a few days before we got back. We wanted to make sure that they had a chance to get everything done and get out of the way. Uh, we're just back here today. We got to take out all of our supports and pull off our boards. Ah, here we go. There we go. Yeah, I do have a screw in there. Fantastic. Just a little bit of a vibration is all it takes. And you can pull these things right out. We got ourselves. Here we go. The irony is, we originally only had 50 bags. It wasn't enough. Uh, so we went and grabbed another 10. And this little lump here is, that represents the extra. Boy, that was, I'm talking about measuring clothes, eh? All right. Here we go. Well, my assistant and I are out here taking a look at the pad now. Um, just wanted to go over a couple of basic details. This is a 10 by 12 foot slab. It took a full yard, sorry, a full ton of gravel uh, and 60 bags of cement to get this finished. So give you an idea of the kind of volume you're looking at for a three inch pour. Um, you can use that sort of math. You can also go to the stone yard and you can give them the size and square footage and the depth that you're going to work with. And they've got a little calculator on their computer and they can formulate your, your stuff for you. This was actually poured over two days because we were running short. So what we did is we poured this whole section and across the front. And then after it had set for about an hour and a half, we managed to broom that and got a pretty good look. The second day, this was done, so that's why you see the line. It doesn't really matter. We're building a shed and it's gonna be seven by 10. So all of the second part of the pour is gonna be inside the shed. We're not concerned. Visually, this is still gonna be stunning. And uh, just really glad. This little machine over here was awesome. We're really pleased because we didn't expect it to make it through the whole process. We thought we'd be mixing the last few bags in the wheelbarrow, but it held up really great. So kudos to that machine. If you're uh, in the market for a cement mixer, 
these little one bag at a time, they're good little machines. And so if you're wondering about the Dunsworth, uh, the funny story here is Max was actually inspired to do cement work. He was watching a video by an actor who was in the uh, Trailer Park Boys series, and he lives out east and done a bunch of concrete work at his house. And so Max was like, I gotta get me a cement mixer and I'm gonna do some concrete work. So when the idea came up to put the shed together, Max was like, oh, I'm gonna make this huge pad for my house. And so he bought this machine. And so since it stood up to the test of time, he's nicknamed it the Dunsworth in honor of the actor. So I think that's pretty darn cool. Well, there we go. As you can see, as a DIYer, you can also make a rather large concrete pad if you need to without buying all the fancy tools. Just follow the advice in the video. Use that board to screed it. Get a broom, give it a little bit of time, and you too can make a concrete pad. So here we are. This is going to be for a shed, but the process remains the same no matter what size you're going to use. Thanks for joining us on the video. If you have questions related to the concrete pour, then by all means, put them in the comments below. And if you're curious about other things you can use it for, ask our questions. Can you use a pad for such and such? We'll be happy to help you out with your specifics. And don't forget to check us out on Instagram. We're really enjoying growing that audience. So if you're an Instagram person, check us out there as well. Home Renovation DIY.